Hello, and welcome to Fierce Conversations with Toby, the show where we talk about the hard things. I'm Toby Dore. In today's episode, we'll get a glimpse into how out-of-the-box thinking can create alternatives for at-risk communities. Our guest today is Frederick Johnson. Born and raised in Chicago, Fred attended high school and college in Iowa. A linebacker for the 1995 R.C. Cola Bowl National Junior College Championship, he was inducted to the Iowa Lakes Hall of Fame in 2015. He holds a BA degree in public administration and an MPA degree in public administration with an emph- emphasis on nonprofit management. Post military, he moved to Kansas City with his wife, Hannah, and two children and completed his MA degree in counseling. In his free time, you may find Fred cutting hair in his barber shop, bowling, bowling in national tournaments crafting the perfect jerk salmon in his smoker, and aspiring to write that first book, which I'm hoping to help him with. Hi, Fred. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, Toby. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. I love seeing your happy face. (laughs) (laughs) I like to ask all my guests a question that kind of gives us a peek into who you are. What's your color, and what does that say about you? My favorite color has been for a long time, uh, sky blue. Mm. Um, you know, and it's funny that when you ask that question, it's, it made me think. And it, the one thing I could think of is that uh, I love the sky. I love looking up to the sky, to the stars, the clouds, mm-hmm. um, it's a science thing, I guess. But uh, I, I think it, it's a, a testament to my imagination. It's ah. a... Uh, yeah, it's a, just a part of, you know, the way I think and um, just and, and just think of all the things that I possibly can achieve. So definitely my imagination. I love that. I just love that. Uh, can you tell us about a crossroads in your life that pushed you in a different direction? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, to be honest, uh, when I was in college, because of the way I grew up, um, I was still on the streets, uh, doing a lot of, um, illegal activity. And, uh, even though I was going to college and my attempts were to just better myself, but I had to provide for myself and my family as well. And it came a moment where I felt like those walls were closing in on me. Um, a couple of situations happened. Uh, some guy showed up to my house to purchase some products and, uh, I didn't know him. Uh, I got a phone call saying that my name was starting to be uh, in the streets a lot more than I would have liked it to have been. And uh, in that moment, I decided uh, my, my, I, was, I already had my son at that time and my, and my girlfriend, fiance, you know, we were mm-hmm. talking about being married and we were had our second child on the way. And uh, I just didn't see myself in prison. I didn't see myself trying to be a father from prison or um, trying to be a, a husband from prison. So I made a decision um, abruptly that same day, actually, to uh, leave the streets, leave school, and uh, go to the military. Ah. And yeah. so uh, my goal, yeah, my goal was to, my nickname is Peanut. <laughs> and my goal was to, uh, in my mind, it, it, the, the idea was to kill Peanut and give birth to Frederick. Ah, I love that. I love that. The military can certainly be a game changer. And I think, you know, when we are at a crossroads and we have a couple directions we can go, sometimes the best thing we can do is just do a total about flip and go in a direction nobody even anticipated. So (laughs) at all. (laughs) Yeah, it certainly forces a change. So you have 25 years of experience as a mental health therapist. And yet you're drawn to serve historically excluded populations. I love that you target these communities. But what pulls you in that direction? I think it probably now that I hear your backstory, maybe it comes from that. But, <laughs> but what do you find well, in those communities? Well, you know, I, I use the word excluded specifically to identify the population that we serve. Um, you know, we can use words like disenfranchised or disadvantaged, Mm -hmm. uh, which are common, but the reason why they're all those things is because we've been excluded. Mm -hmm. And so, um, because of that exclusion, it draws me to make sure that 
we're able to um, just do our part um, from my own, like, as you said, from my own uh, story, my own coming up and coming of age, I, I, I recognize a lot of the uh, pitfalls that existed in my own okay. journey. And one of them was a lack of information and the lack of um, options. And mm-hmm. so uh, I had a supervisor ask me once, why do we as social workers believe that we can save everyone? And I responded that I don't believe we can save everyone. And I think that might be a shortcoming and why there's such a burnout, a high burnout rate in social work. My only goal is to make sure that we are giving individuals the options and the information so that they can make the decision for themselves. I think that's beautiful. That's something that they can take into the rest of their life because it's not realistic to always have a therapist holding your hand. You have to learn to stand on your own feet. So that's beautiful. So you're a combat veteran, having served in Operation Iraqi Freedom as a supply sergeant with an Army Ranger unit. How does your military service influence your life today? Excuse me. Um, One word, uh, discipline. Ah, that's a good word. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely discipline. Um, My mom, uh, as you were speaking earlier, the, the complete, you know, about face. My mom, when I told her I was going to the military, her first comment out of her mouth was literally, they're going to put you in jail. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, you have no faith in me. <laughs> and I said, well, why, why do you think they're going to put me in jail? And her response was, you know, you don't have any respect for authority. And I, and I said, well, mom, you know, at some point I have to grow up and I have mm-hmm. to take responsibility for myself. Mm-hmm. And um, going to the military, uh, it really taught me discipline. It taught me how to uh, have tact. Um, it taught me how to um, motivate myself to have that drive to get things completed and what it really meant to be a leader and to have soldiers that um, followed you and you had That's to right. protect because it could truthfully, honestly be a life and death situation as it yeah. was on the streets as well. Mm-hmm. I think that's beautiful. And you found an organization called Diversify Youth. Can you tell us more about that organization? Um, definitely. Diversify Youth is something that uh, it came to my mind as a young person. Um, it just started off as, uh, I used to say to myself, diversify my hustle. I wanted to diversify my hustle. I never wanted to be one dimensional. And as I, again, through my journey, I always kept that as a, as a reminder of who I wanted to be, but then also how I want to help other individuals be able to diversify themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's about, again, providing options. It's about not being one dimensional, um, giving yourself opportunities to do whatever it is you want to do. We want to expose individuals to things in life that um, allows them to be the best version of themselves. And so, um, you know, not only do we do, the mental health therapy, but we also have other programs that we will be implementing um, just as our growth continues in the community to have uh, other ways to assist individuals as best as possible. Mm -hmm. And you you are also a barber. And I think you told me once that it's one of the best places to do counseling. So tell me how that fits into your overall picture. Um, You know, so we have... uh, I had a guy come into the barbershop one day and um, he asked me to pray for his wife uh, to come back to him. And I told him that I couldn't do that because I didn't know the circumstances of the situation. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what I can do is I can, you know, pray that God can help, you know, resolve your situation. And instantly that gentleman started to cry. I had never met this thing before. Mm -hmm. And it was like this pouring out of information Mm -hmm. and, it shows the testament to how people are when they're in that barber chair. There's such a level of comfort. And then also mm-hmm. the the ability to speak to a stranger without mm-hmm. um, having judgment. So um, that barber chair plays a huge role in therapy. Um, and it plays a huge role in what we do for Diversify You as well. Um, I have a barber chair at a school that I, uh, I work for. 
And it's it plays a huge part in allowing the young men who typically aren't prepared to speak to someone like a therapist or a counselor. Mm-hmm. But when they get in that chair, boom, they open up and they're just ready to talk about all of their problems and and hope that they can receive some good information to help them do and be better. That's beautiful, you know, you and that's really out of the box thinking. So you're you're taking advantage of somewhere where someone doesn't feel threatened or pressured to talk and turning it into the perfect opportunity to get from therapy. Yes. I think you've also created a barber college, haven't you? Yes, so yes, tell definitely. Tell us a little um, about that. Well, I was doing some work. Um, I work with the homeless um, and the homeless veterans, and I was working with the organization here in Kansas City, and they had a barber shop um, in their facility. And so myself and the, the chaplain that works there, we collaborated and we created um, a barber college uh, with the goal and intentions of having the homeless individuals that are attempting to reintegrate back into society and individuals that are um, recently released from prison um, have an opportunity to not only learn a trade, but also uh, receive that intensive mental health service as well. Uh, With that, you know, it gives them the ability to heal and through that process, as they learn that trade, maybe they won't be barbers, but, um, you know, they'll learn to trust themselves again and to trust individuals in the community and um, just become a positive role model back in society. I think that's pretty powerful. And, you know, when we have something to do and when we learn that we are capable of doing something, it, it increases your confidence in going out and trying something else. So, definitely, yeah, I think you're accomplishing a lot of things with just that one little uh, barber chair. Thank you. Our world today seems very polarized and outraged. What do you think we can do to soothe the anger in our communities? You know, it's, I tell the best way I answer questions is in story form. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and quickly, my, my aunt, she called me one time, which is rare. doesn't really happen that much, but she <laughs> called me and she wanted to talk to me. And she spoke with me about her relationship, which at that time just wasn't in a good place. Mm-hmm. Um, I think she chose me because of my therapist's background, which was still kind of odd because I was never that choice for her. <laughs> but as she told me just everything that was going on and, you know, you could hear the the pain and the joy and the 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 frustration and the anger and the entire conversation. Um, at the end, as I sat there and listened to all of it and the crying and, and the, the not crying, mm-hmm. at the end, she said to me, I just want to thank you for listening. Um, when I talk to my sisters, you know, including my mom, you know, it's like they always have an opinion and they always want to tell me what to do or tell me what I need, but you just listen and I appreciate that. Uh And I think that that's one of the, um, overlooked, uh, traits that we have as the entire community is that we tend to not listen. And I think that if we take a time, take a minute to sit back and actually listen to what the community is asking for, then we can better serve them. I think that's really important. And I think you're right. Listening is a skill that's kind of gone by the wayside. Everybody's so interested in what they're going to say next that they don't often take the time to just sit and listen. And it's a pretty powerful gift to just give someone the gift of listening to them. So I think that's really good. I think we can make the world a better place by breaking generational curses and providing opportunities in areas where few exist. You also work as a school-based therapist, providing intense services and teaching social emotional learning classes. What changes are you seeing through that work? Um, you know, what we see and what our goal is, is, is we want to see um, increase uh, in grades and increasing in uh, just cooperation with the teachers and staff 
um, and then collaboration with each other's and, and their peer groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, what we what we see when we go into the school and some under some situations, circumstances is that there's just a lack of um, compassion and understanding and patience. Um, we as teachers, as therapists, as staff, whatever it may be, there's gaps between us and the young people that that are here today. And we have to respect that we're different and yeah. they're different, but we have to, again, listen to what they're asking for and stop telling them what we think they need. You know, mm-hmm. it has to be a collaboration between us and them as well. Mm-hmm. And I believe that once that is achieved, that we will be able to see them grow into the positive young people that they are. Um, but definitely uh, teaching conflict resolution and giving them the ability to um, understand and identify that everything doesn't deserve or require a response. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they can move through school and not give energy to negativity. Um, and they can feel free and be free to express themselves emotionally to individuals that are there to provide that service for them. Uh, be as made back in a lot of our communities, we do have the stigmatism towards therapy and mental health. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to um, break that as well. Yeah. You know, it seems like it all comes once again to listening and, and trying to see what the kids have in mind and, and coaching them through standing on their own. So I think that's yeah. pretty powerful. I mean, and they are the future. If we let our Correct. children you know, follow in negative footsteps, then we're kind of all doomed. So I think that's beautiful. You told me the last time we talked that you're an aspiring author and have a book in mind. Can you give us a peek into the topic of your book? Well, I can tell you that the title of my book is More Black People Should Be Eaten by Sharks. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> and what's the story behind that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, again, I am a I am an observant person. Um, I just watch and I listen and I learn. Uh-huh. And um, one of the things that been, like being in the barbershop, you know, we watch the news. And just for example, something comes across on some TV show or some clip or whatever it may be. And it's like, oh, someone died. Uh, bungee cord jumping, someone died skydiving, someone was injured uh, by a shark attack. Mm-hmm. And, and, and instantly there's this like, you know, response like, oh, I bet you was a white person, you know, he <laughs> definitely a white person. Like people don't do those things. And I, I, I try to connect things. I call it universal connectivity. And mm-hmm. I try to connect things to get a better understanding of why we do the things we do, why we don't do the things we do. And, um, you know, in our, in the, in the black community, there is a lot of fear, uh, you know, doing certain things, stepping okay. outside the box, um, be in places where we typically aren't, okay. you know, black folks don't go in the woods, black folks don't go out there in the shark water and, okay. you know, you don't do the, and my connection to that is, is, if we don't do these things, does that also impact how we live our lives just in mm-hmm. our day to day? You know, does it give us freedoms to just push out into the world without fear, with just no regard to things that we um, barriers that we put up for ourselves? Mm-hmm. And so the book is based off of a lot of um, a, a term for it is uh, negative bias, mm-hmm. uh, you know, just meaning that. We we tend to lean more towards the things that we don't do than the things that we're actually willing to do. Ah, that's interesting. I think that sounds Here's like an totally. awesome book. I can't wait Thank to, you. for you to get to Thank work on it. I think it's just awesome. So Thank how can we, the public, help your mission? You know, I I think that... Um, you know, one of the things that we, we have that we deal with is, uh, you know, always going to be funding and uh-huh. uh, just giving opportunities to create more for the communities that we serve. 
Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you you try to have fundraisers and you try to do uh, GoFundMe's and things like that, and it just never happens. Um, you don't build the right funds for the for the barber college, for example. You know, we needed so much just to get started. And I tried different avenues and even with the organizations that I've worked with sometimes, mm-hmm. there's always these barriers and it's so wow. hard. Grants even, you know, grants get pushed to bigger uh, organizations and not the smaller organizations. So there's always going to be a funding problem um, with mm-hmm. these kind of programs. And uh, with the mental health part, yeah, we can build insurances and things of that nature. But there's still barriers there. Mm-hmm. So um, just volunteering, um, learning more, being a better listener, and mm-hmm. um, just knowing the difference between uh, finding out which organizations are there for the community and community enrichment and not the ones mm-hmm. that's just there to kind of be pretty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I like that. I know that I personally, there's uh, animal rescue organizations that I support over others because you know, they're in it for the real thing. And you guys are in it for the real Mm -hmm. thing. You're not just, you know, big organization with a lot of grants and a deep pocket. So I think that's beautiful. And I think any community we live in, we're going to find organizations and opportunities just like yours. And your organization is in the Kansas City area. Uh, But there's no reason why we can't be involved in something that's outside of our community. And we should be looking to see what is available in our communities too, and be involved and be a part of it. Cause we all have 15 minutes we can give or, you know, $5 we can give and, and it makes a difference. It all adds up. Yes. So Fred, yes. is there one question you wish I'd asked that I didn't? Is there one other thing you'd <laughs> like to share with us? You know, um, when I was in when I was in my undergrad, I had an eighty page paper, and a part of that paper was a ten page segment where the teacher asked for us to uh, create a program for uh, hopelessness. Mm. And at the time, I, I was still young. I was very I was probably nineteen, twenty years old, and you know, I had a lot of my own issues and anger going on, and I just didn't see what a program could possibly look like to create, you know, hope. Mm -hmm. And so I only gave him an eight, eight sentence response. And it was (laughs) along the line of, there's no such thing as a program. (laughs) 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 And and I can tell you, I was working for an organization um, a couple years ago and I had a young lady um, sit in front of me who had been, essentially sex trafficked and um and through that you know became a drug um a drug addiction and uh you know things just got worse and she was in prison for about five years Mm -hmm. and so here she is at my desk and i'm helping her out and um there was a time where i even had to like step in and make a comment to this gentleman that had been bringing her to the uh organization for Mm -hmm. assistance And I think that was probably one of the first times she actually seen a man probably stand up for her and Mm. not want anything from her. Mm -hmm. Um, And as I continue to assist her, her day to day, her, her, her tone picked up her, her voice got louder. Um, She smiled more. And then she was laughing um, Mm. with our encounters. And in that moment, I realized that is creating hope that what we're doing here Mm -hmm. is creating hope for this young individual. Yeah. And it just made me think about that. And so with that is just be consistent and be, you know, and and have a heart to, you know, just be there for someone. And when you see that hopelessness setting in, know that it can turn around um, with our own diligence. I love that. And I do think, you know, with Diversify You and the other things you're involved in, you have created a program to address hopelessness. So your instructor was on to something there. You just didn't know it yet. (laughs) Didn't know it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Fred. I loved having you on the show. And I will include a link to your website in our show notes as well. All right. Thank you. Remember, none of us is our worst mistake. 
We all have so much more to offer the world. And those so-called mistakes are blessed opportunities to learn and grow. Next week, we'll continue to bring you inspiring stories by people who've identified a need for change and are working to make a difference in the world. Subscribe to our Patreon channel, Fierce Conversations, for special access and behind-the-scenes info. Go to patreon.com slash Fierce Conversations or click on the link in the show notes. 10% of the Patreon proceeds are dedicated to providing workbooks to women in prison. The show notes will also provide a link to the Diversify You website and a link to purchase my memoir, Living with Conviction. As I talk about in depth in my memoir, I had a conversation while in prison where my friend Lisa told me, in here, we can talk about all the hard things. In fact, I think we must, and so we shall. This is Fierce Conversations with Toby, where we do talk about the hard things. Until next time.